uh, hello and welcome to the Interdisciplinary Research Forum. Uh, our forum is primarily intended to uh, promote and encourage uh, interdisciplinary research at London Met and forge uh, cooperation with colleagues from other universities and with uh, practitioners as well. My name is Svetlana Stevenson and I will be chairing today's event. And we have a fascinating subject today, which is who defines knowledge, listening to marginalized and uh, vulnerable voices. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. And uh, uh, please put uh, your questions in the chat box and uh, I will read them at the end or I will uh, call you uh, to speak. So we will not be inviting substantive questions during the presentations. So at this seminar we will be addressing questions which are a key issue uh, which are key issues that face researchers doing research with marginalized and oppressed groups. Why are the experiences, opinions and perspectives of people uh, who are uh, marginalized, hard to reach, often dismissed and silenced? Do experts know better? And what can we do to prevent epistemic injustice, denial of voice to the oppressed. So we will try to address all these issues from uh, the perspectives of a variety of disciplines, sociology, criminology and uh, philosophy of knowledge. But of course these issues are uh, also important for people who are interested in politics, policy making, international relations, law, uh, management, education, and social research more broadly. Uh, now, if I may say a few words at the beginning, I think uh, all of us who conducted research with groups who really have a public voice will have come across some particularly troubling questions. Uh, and I certainly faced these questions when I did my research with homeless people and with marginalized youth. Uh, am I truly representing them? Does what I offer to the world on the basis of a certain number of interviews or a few months in the field represent knowledge? Does my research in any realistic way benefit the people I have been studying? Am I exploiting these people for my own career purposes? And are we, predominantly middle class academic, just writing stories for each other's consumption? To feed our sense of moral indignation with the system? Or assuage guilt about our privileges, and simply then to allow the world to continue uh, exactly as it did. And what can I do to make my research both truthful and capable of making a difference? So today we are lucky to have a panel of academics with rich experience of uh, conducting research with marginalized groups. Each has grappled with these issues, and I'm sure we will learn a lot from them. So please welcome Dr. Julius Elster and Dr. James Alexander from London Met, uh, Dr. Tara Young from the University of Kent, and Dr. Susie Halley from the University of Cambridge. Now, the first speaker today is Dr. Julius Elster from our own a school of social professions. We are actually indebted to Julian for the theme of this seminar, which he kindly suggested for the program. Now, just a few words about Julius. He was educated at LSE and University of Birmingham, and his main field of study is sociology of youth, social epistemology, and contemporary social theory. 
Uh, his research examines, among other things, the concept of reflexivity, uh, negative and stigmatized representations of young people, epistemic injustice, super diversity and youth identity formation. And before embarking on his academic trajectory, Julius was a youth project manager for Tottenham Hotspur Football Club and for Herringay Council, developing and running outreach programs in North and East London. So it's, it's a fascinating biography, actually, uh, and set of skills. Uh, so uh, Julius's uh, presentation uh, is uh, entitled Making Marginalized Voices, uh, sorry, Taking Marginalized Voices Seriously. So uh, Julius, um, I, I will now upload you, uh, sh share your presentation and uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you so much Svetlana for putting together and chairing this seminar. So, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the other speakers actually. That's the main reason why I attended. No, so um, we often proclaim that one of the purposes of uh, higher education is knowledge production and dissemination. But certain knowledges are kept out of dominant epistemic systems. Perhaps actually before I carry on, I should maybe make it clear that when I talk about epistemic stuff, I mean stuff related to knowledge. So for example, with um, uh, dominant epistemic systems, I mean knowledge and testimonies that are generally accepted as legitimate by those in power and the wider society. So many are still marginalized by political and intellectual systems that continue to prioritize privileged voices. So based on my research into young people, many of whom are excluded from engaging in dominant knowledge product production practices, I shall argue that rather than tuning into privileged voices, we should listen to those who are epistemically privileged. So that is, the people directly experiencing something are the ones whose knowledge claims we should take seriously. So I'll be drawing on interviews with 18, 15 to 25 year olds from the North London area of Tottenham. It goes without saying these young people have an epistemic advantage regarding immediate knowledge of everyday life in Tottenham for Youth. Yet, the media, political elite, academia to some degree, have dominated the discourse on Tottenham's young people since the 2011 riots. So, this particular research began outside of academia. It was a response to concerns expressed by numerous young people in the aftermath of the England riots of 2011. So drawing from uh, my personal experience of working with young people in Tottenham, an area affected by the 2011 riots, I encountered many young individuals speaking of how they are misrepresented and perceived in negative ways by the media and people outside their in-group. So I'll start by providing a bit of a context around my research and then I'll look at the, the so-called uh, riot discourse that has had an immense impact on how many young people in Tottenham are perceived. In the second part of my talk I shall say a few words about um, the significance of applying the distinction between the internal perspective and the external perspective. And closely linked to, to the former, the, the internal perspective, is the notion of epistemic privilege. Namely, that a person has privileged access to their own thoughts and experiences in such a way that others do not. So to take this notion seriously means that we acknowledge that so-called lay people may know more about the situation than so-called experts. 
For example, members of oppressed groups are epistemically advantaged with respect to understanding their own oppression. Despite this, they are often undervalued as knowers and silenced with respect to testimony. So since the 2011 rise, an extensive body of literature on Tottenham has emerged. I believe I learned perhaps more from listening to the young voices in Tottenham than any text written about their situation and identities. So Tottenham is located in the London borough of Haringey, which is here in North London. And to the right here, we have a map of Haringey. And according to the index of multiple deprivation, residents in, in the 10th percentile, they are the areas shaded darkest on the map here. They are among the 10% most deprived small neighborhood areas in England. So as you can see, deprivation is heavily concentrated here on the east side of Haringey, which is exactly where Tottenham is located. So Tottenham is culturally, linguistically and religiously diverse. About 200 first languages are spoken. And in terms of ethnicity, this bar chart gives quite a clear indication that there's no longer an ethnic majority group that's dominant based on its demographic majority position. Uh, I spoke about this uh, or some of the implication of this at a different seminar a couple of weeks ago. So despite the fact that Tottenham is one of the most diverse constituencies in the world, there's a tendency of the media, politicians and some social scientists to reduce residents in Tottenham to a single identity. So tell me, one of my research participants, uh, it's not her real name, it's been pseudonymized. So she reacted to this. I don't get why some think we're all the same in Tottenham. Of course, most likely Tottenham residents are known to be diverse. So the emergence of these negative and homogeneous representations is, of course, connected to the dominant discourse around the England riots of 2011. So for those of you who are not familiar with the, with the England riots, it started in Tottenham with a fatal police shooting of Mr. Mark Duggan, an unarmed young black male from Tottenham's Broadwater Farm Estate. So the discourse around the riots has had an immense impact on how Tottenham's young people are perceived, which in turn may influence how these young people see themselves. Camille, Camille says here, obviously Tottenham riots was something that got a lot of media attention. And it's just maybe a label that Tottenham hasn't been able to shake. I would say that people are just judging from the information that they got from the media, they would negatively perceive Tottenham. So why should we make such a big deal about these negative misrepresentations? Well, uh, because homogeneous and stereotypical images have long lasting harmful effects on those being misrepresented. So Sapphire here, uh, I believe she gives some kind of epistemological explanation of why negative stereotypes about Tottenham youth perpetuate. So she says, once you have a negative idea about someone, it's very hard to bring up the positive things. When something good does happen, it's hard for you to build on that once you already have that negative idea at the back of your mind. While Lesedi, she states that, if you see stereotypical images enough times, you can be disillusioned and believe that there's actually nothing out there for me except for these stereotypes. And the, the latter quote, I believe, is kind of connected to what we would normally refer to as self-stereotyping, namely this tendency to describe yourself in terms of prototypical group characteristics. You kind of integrate commonly held stereotypes about your in-group into your self-concept. 
by the way, the research I carried out, very few young people were kind of uh, associated with a tendency of self-stereotyping. So who do my research participants blame for the emergence of these stereotypes falsely attributed to youth in Tottenham? Samaya so says, I personally think that the media influences the way people think and perceive us. The media makes them think, and I suppose them, she perhaps mean uh, the, the general public, think that everyone wearing a hoodie must be dangerous, but that's not really the case. So to the question, um, what do you think the media, media's representations of Tottenham is? Jaden here answers negative. We are all represented as gangsters and crazy dangerous bandits. This makes me feel pretty angry and it also makes me think negative things about the area I live in. I wish they showed the positive side more. Then maybe, just maybe, I could feel better about where I'm from. So this interview is taken from um, a workshop that took place at Tottenham's Burnley Ground Art Centre that I also attended and it's been since printed in a, in a magazine by a youth communication charity called Expulsion. So these negative and inaccurate media representations of Tottenham have a harmful influence on how Jaden experiences his local area and to some degree how he sees himself. So he provided a bit of um, advice here at the end. So people who are not from Tottenham should come and see the reality. So how do politicians portray Tottenham's young people and the riots? So ex-Prime Minister Cameron, remember him? He characterized the lives of the young people associated with the riot-affected areas as resulting from an absence of morality and community among the urban underclass. And um, I think he was the Secretary of State for Justice, Ken Clark, and um, the Mayor of London at the time. They took kind of this re rhetoric one step further by speaking about the same people as belonging to a feral criminal underclass. So the riot discourse quickly became dense with them and us attitudes. Kind of an underclass seemed to operate with an entirely different moral and cultural frame separate from the rest of us. And of course, this report put together on behalf of uh, Boris Johnson, it took another riot, uh, talked about Tottenham residents as passive participants trapped in a vicious cycle of deprivation and degradation where unemployment, addictions, low education attainment, poor health, youth alienation and crime interconnect in a causal relationship as mutually reinforcing dynamics. A description that nobody in Tottenham can truly identify with. So let's take stock. So the young people call into question the dominant discourse which misrepresents them and marginalizes their voices. And they are far too often treated as a homogeneous unit, which of course is absurd given the heterogeneous diverse demographic uh, the demographic profile of Tottenham's young people. So what about the social scientists? So instead of providing these condemnatory representations of young people associated with the right affected areas, sociological commentators opt for a more empathetic attitude, emphasizing underlying socioeconomic factors as playing some part. So the sociological literature spoke about racist uh, stop and search practices by the police and deprivation and few job opportunities beyond precarious contracts and unreasonably low wages. So although attention to socioeconomic factors is really, really important, these factors present only a partial picture or how structural inequalities impact on people who are experiencing it. So I focus on these kind of mainly 
quantitative factors can sometimes direct epistemic attention away from what I shall now call the internal perspective, namely away from the lived experiences and testimonies of those under scrutiny. So during the thematic analysis stage of my research, I found it increasingly important to highlight the discrepancy between uh, the internal perspective and the external perspective. And there are here, of course, some resemblances between this distinction and what Anthenics meant by insider understandings and uh, outsider constructions. And also Tariq Modu has recently spoken about uh, something similar, what he referred to as from the inside out and from the outside in. What do I mean by the internal and external perspectives? So the internal perspective indicates the way in which someone or some group perceives, perceives their own identity and situation. So in the case of my study, young people in Tottenham inhabits the internal perspective when it comes to understanding young people in Tottenham. While the external perspective indicates how others perceive some individual or group. So in the case of of the discourse around Tottenham in the aftermath of the 2011 riots, the media, politicians, the general public and sociologists represent the external perspective. And I suppose I have to conclude myself here. So even though I've lived in Tottenham, worked with Tottenham's young people, carried out relevant research in Tottenham, I still represent the perspective that lacks epistemic access to the experiences of young people who may feel marginalized by different systems of oppression, since I'm neither young nor marginalized. So, should the internal and external perspectives be valued equally? So again, let's listen to the research participants, since the internal-external distinction was implicitly a common theme in their answers. So let's set it for instance, spoke about how media's portrayal of Tottenham's young people during the England riots was unrecognizable to the young people actually living in Tottenham. So she said, I was shocked by how the media portrayed youth in Tottenham because when the riots happened, we were looking at the news and I just didn't understand because it's quiet here. Young people around here, we are basically not the way TV and newspapers describe us. So what Les Sedi is alluding to in this quote is that the external perspective of the news media is epistemically inferior to the internal perspective of the young people who actually live in Tottenham. So why is the internal perspective so important? Or I could perhaps phrase it, why should epistemic attention be given to the internal perspective? So Amaya believes that in the context of understanding young people in Tottenham, she should be given epistemic authority. Why? Because she is in a unique position. That is, she has epistemically privileged access to comprehend what's really going on. Because, as she says, I'm a teenager. I'm in this, you know, day and age. So I know what it's like to be a Tottenham teenager. I know what it's like to see what's going on, so I know that's not every person that wears a hoodie is a gang member. So recognizing the internal perspective means to recognize epistemic privilege, and recognizing epistemic privilege means to center the lives and experiences of people experiencing vulnerability, oppression, harm, prejudice, and so on and so forth, because they are the ones who hold epistemically privileged access to their own lives and experiences. So despite the fact that the internal perspective of the young people in this study is clearly the one that's inhabiting an epistemically privileged position, many internal perspectives are prevented from making a contribution to dominant discourses or what Miranda Fricke calls 
the pool of epistemic resources. So both Camille and Lesedi here provides examples of how prejudice, or of course we could call it racism, not only reduces them to a single identity, but also reduces the chances to engage in dominant knowledge production practices. So let's say here, uh, she was born in Kenya, brought up in Tottenham, a very high achieving student. She said, um, people often perceive me as different or other, or may not think that there's more to me. While like Camille here, uh, she got a Bayesian background. She talked about experiencing identity prejudice and, and feeling uncomfortable uh, around people who don't share her experiences. So they may not see me as me, she said. They may see me just as another black girl. I suppose there's a, a lesson here for researchers as well that there's clearly a, an unequal hierarchy of epistemic relations between those who have more epistemic power and those who have less. So a consequence of this is the assumed epistemic privilege of researchers over their research participants' experiences and testimonies, which can result in disbelief and misinterpretation and, um, and silencing. So these negative experiences usually took place when the young people ventured out of Tottenham and encountered socially dominant groups who do not share their identities and experiences. So finally, Chantal says here, when you go to a place where a lot of people aren't familiar with Tottenham or they've heard things in the media, you automatically get, get tagged as that person or that child from Tottenham. You are perceived in a certain way, a negative way. And I feel that's really unfair, to be honest, because that's not who we are. You can't define us from the way that the media portray us. Deep. So let me conclude. So by including the voices of young people, all of whom were from Tottenham, I've come to realise that Tottenham's young people portray themselves as vastly different from the stereotypical representations provided by the media and politicians in the aftermath of the 2011 England riots. This gave rise to a distinction between the uh, internal perspective and the external perspective. So the former here indicates that a subject possesses epistemic privilege by having the capacity to perceive itself and understand its experiences. Those who inhabit the external perspective, on the other hand, they lack direct epistemic access to the experiences of an individual or a group. So in taking subjective first-hand experiences, or what I've called the internal perspective, into account. Analysis has the potential to avoid top-down, one-dimensional, homogeneous, stereotypical understandings. So members of marginalized groups may of course have the concept, you know, the concepts and conceptual resources with which to make sense of their experiences. The problem may lie in a lack of uptake from those with more social power. And here I, of course, include those of us working within academia. So research that intends to avoid undermining different subjugated knowledges, as Michel Foucault and Patricia Hill Collins call them, requires that we believe the testimonies of those experiencing oppression and discrimination. This in turn, requires us as researchers to facilitate safe discursive spaces where, in the case of my research area, young, often marginalized people can express beliefs and share experiences without having to regularly smother their testimonies. And I'm here, of course, drawing on Christy Dotson's uh, notion of epistemic smothering. So I'm talking about a space where they feel epistemically safe and are recognized 
as knowers of their own experiences. I should probably hand over the mic to Svetlana at this point. So thank you so much for, for, for turning up and tuning in. I can't wait to hear the other speakers and answering your questions in a minute. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Julius. It's a fascinating uh, topic and there are quite a few questions at the moment, but what I suggest is that we leave the questions uh, uh, towards the end, uh, well, no, not really the end, but to ask them after the uh, all the presentations, if you don't mind. So, so at the moment we'll just collect all the questions. But it was it was a very interesting and thought provoking talk. Thank you. So now uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. James Alexander from the School of Social Sciences. Uh, I hope he is here. Um, he had some issues here. Yeah, he's here. Okay, so, so uh, James's research interests involve understanding why particular neighborhoods become places of serious youth criminality. And uh, as such, his current study looks at how the changing dynamics on a housing estate over a 15 year period have uh, influenced the actions and behaviors of different groups of young people. And although his, uh, he focuses on youth crime, James's research seeks to understand the role that social undercurrents play in the emergence of criminality, not so much the crimes themselves. So his recent publication is titled, Can Professional Interventions contribute to an escalation in cases of youth violence. It's absolutely fascinating theme. And uh, James also is currently evaluating a local authority youth safety program and a violence reduction unit funded project aimed at reducing school exclusions. So his uh, talk today is entitled what knowledge and whose knowledge am I defining? So, James, I, I hope that you you can now present your uh, talk. Uh, thanks, thanks, Lana. Um, Great. Share my uh, the slides. So, and thanks, Julius, as well. It's really I found that really interesting um, having. Uh, been in uh, Brixton during the riots and just watched and people coming out of curries offering me uh, lots of different things. Uh, yeah, it was quite interesting, the, the write-up afterwards and how it was very different to, to what was going on. Um, so I, I really, I need to apologise at the start because in trying to present uh, something, I, I really just came up with a load of questions that I'm not sure I was able to answer fully. Um, and so I'm trying to going to get around some of that by just telling some stories, really, and hopefully we'll come to, to something at the end of it. Uh, but I, the first thing that I really noticed uh, in, in looking at this is, is kind of my, my researcher privilege, um, which I, I find quite uh, considerable in the fact that actually I'm in a position to be able to collect, compile, evaluate, analyze and publish knowledge and experiences of others. Um, and I really am reliant on those experiences of others, but I almost turn those experiences into an, an academic commodity. Um, and kind of as I kind of thought about today, that made me quite uneasy. Um, and it made me think again about some of what I thought in the past I was doing which was good and maybe consider whether or not uh, you know it was appropriate and, and I'm also aware that you know I could walk away from the experiences that I collect but others can't they live with it daily um, one of the projects I'm, I'm going to talk to you about is kind of the, the ethnographic kind of project uh, Svetlana spoke a little bit about uh, that formed part of my kind of PhD but sort of is carried on uh, and carried on. Um, in it, I was living on quite a deprived housing estate. I'd lived there for a number of years beforehand. Um, but one of the things that always 
made me stand out as different is I had the financial means to move off if I wanted to. And when my family got too big for where I was living, we did move off. Uh, others didn't have that, those choices. So I was very aware that even though this was an ethnography, I was part of it. I was slightly different. I was slightly different as well because I had a, a kind of other colleagues around me uh, in academia that I could talk to, that I could express uh, how I'm feeling to the people that were I was interviewing, the people that I was researching didn't have any of that. Um, you know, but also those experiences that you know other people shared with me, it helped me further my career. Their involvement in my research didn't actually help them at all, or very help them very little. Um, you know, I, I'm still in a privileged position to uh, be able to help some people. You know, with various different things helping them get jobs and everything like that because of the relationships I form but actually my research with them didn't really change much much about the existence that they're living in very much at all and so they didn't really benefit very much um, and so this leads me to think about what are my responsibilities as a researcher what am I meant to be doing um, and also kind of from Becker 1967 whose side are we on and Becker quite openly says you know as a researcher social researcher be on the side of the vulnerable be on the side of the voiceless um, and I tried to uh, one of the papers I got published kind of earlier on this year when I first uh, sent it in to somewhere I made that very stark and very clear that I was taking sides and it just you know got rejected and one of the comments from one of you know this isn't this isn't what academia is meant to be about um, and so there is that that challenge there and you know lots of my my research uh, or some of my research that I was able to do myself that I, I planned myself uh, it comes out of almost an anger and I'm not sure it's, it's meant to you know it, it, my PhD research that you know and the ongoing stuff after after my PhD, I I'd lived on the estate. I'd, I'd done projects on the estate with these the people that became my respondents for years beforehand. You now we ran a um, uh, an after school club in this. It was a converted flat into kind of a community hall, and uh, we ran it for years. And, and the one of the helpers, one of the ladies that that became the kind of my my daughter's godmother. She was a lot older, and she was explaining some of the. The experiences and every time we we had a meeting and she'd been doing this stuff for years we had a meeting with the council with with kind of the police no one wanted to listen to her no one was absolutely interested in they wanted the the to hear the voices of kind of organizations like the st giles trust the the council the police they were who set the agenda and then when i started doing the research and i said oh can i interview you and she's like yeah uh, okay and it turned out the reason where we were in that building, there's a youth club on the estate that just wasn't being, it was hired out to, to other people now. And the reason why we're in that building is because when that building was a youth club, only white kids were allowed to go there. And she set up an alternative project for anyone on the estate. And for the first two years, she had to run it outside, hiding from the, the, the rain, covering themselves, in, trying to get shelter from the, from the trees. And it was only after two years when they realized they weren't go she wasn't going to go away that they offered this other space. And now she's in meetings after 20 years of doing this and still people aren't listening to her. And for me, that and to now still talking about it, it makes me angry. And that we're not meant to necessarily be angry as researchers, but it's some of these things that I think we need to start to say, you know what, I am going to privilege these voices. I am going to say that this is, in my research, these voices are a, a priority. We don't need to be balanced. We need to be, uh, we need to take sides. We need to stand up for those that aren't being listened to anymore. And this is easy for me. This was fairly easy in the bottom picture, picture of the estate. Um, when you're on an estate like this, you know, as, as kind of an academic, as it's quite easy, right? You're there, and yes, you know, understand you're privileged, but actually, you are there, and you've got some tools 
to give voice and you can shape and you can direct things. When you're in an office block like this top one and people are commissioning you uh, to do research, those power relationships are slightly different. And, you know, some of the research that I'm, I, I, I'm doing now for, for other organizations uh, and they're commissioning us, I'm looking at what they're wanting me to do and I'm thinking, this is just going to reinforce how you've set this up is just going to reinforce the, the, the traditional narrative, the narrative of the powerful. You know, it, was ex it is accepted that there's gangs. It is accepted that there's, you know, all of the, the, these young guys are exploiting other people. It is accepted that the youth workers and the police know best. And I'm looking at this situation and the list of the names of people that they or the organizations that they want me to talk to. And they're the same names that the residents of the, the other work that I've been doing, you know, outside of this are telling me are letting them down. And it made me very conscious of what do I do in this situation, because when I'm the kind of the lead researcher, it's fairly easy. You know, I can shape things how I want to. When I'm in a meeting with people that are paying me now to do this research and I can see that actually the way this is set up, they, you know, and it's they're not doing it out of kind of any conceit or anything like that. This is just the world that they live in. The world that they live in, certain people have privileged voices. But if I carry out this research in the way that they want me to do it, Am I really going to represent the views of the voiceless or am I just going to kind of regurgitate the narratives that are already in existence? And how do I feel about that? On the one hand, it might, you know, strengthen my career. They're going to produce something that is going to be really good uh, and, and really strong. But on the other hand, is it really going to do what I as a researcher want to do and you know and i've had several conversations with with people um I'm, i've been in, in a fairly decent situation with i know some people well about this and i've said look i want to include other people in the, in, in these re this research but then how am i sure that the, the voice their voices are going to be prioritized by the local authority by the, the government department or Am I just going to do that in vain? And it's that power relationship thing that I think was is, I think interesting. When I was do, doing, well, when I'm doing the the research on on this estate, I had a certain amount of power over that uh, research to shape it in how I want how I wanted it, you know. And I was able to sit down with kind of different residents and things to say, look what what do we want to include in this when you're in another situation and you're almost like a, you're just working for someone that relationship is a lot different and i and i fear that lots of the lots of the research that comes out around especially around youth violence and gangs and, and things like that i worry about how much has already been decided before the the research has started and how much of it has already been determined by uh, those that, voices that are, we are going to listen to the most. And so with the one of the sorry one of the points we've got to look at and I had to argue you know and I had to think about myself in, in, in this with the ethnography I want to speak to those who have a, a story to tell. But then I'm the one defining who has a story to tell and who doesn't. And so even in my kind of concern or my concern about kind of how the other research projects are constructed, I'm doing the same thing. And I'm deciding that this, the, the, this group of per people it's their story I want to tell rather than other people. And in reality, 
I chose those who could help tell the story that I wanted to tell. And yes, it was, you know, re residents who were systematically marginalized. Um, but it was only a, a certain group of those residents. And with the young people, it was, you know, the, the estate had a kind of an issue with, with, with young people, um, which is why there was lots of attention going on, on about it. And, you know, the, uh, the article, the, the title of the article that uh, Svetlana read out, you know, my take on that or the research showed that actually the more the local authority and others invested in that estate and put services in, in, in that state by professionals, the more it attracted young people and then more, the more crime and the more uh, violence occurred. Um, and then now, kind of years later, looking back on it, the, you know, the, we had a group of 10 young people that were, had some, there were some concerns around the local authorities stepped in that that suddenly became 30 young people. Now there's nothing going on in the state. There's four young people that are of, of serious concern. But in that research that I was doing, you know, I was doing at the time where there was 30 young people around, even that research that I, I could do with those young people was around only those that could tr that trusted me. So there's a whole group of young people that whose voices were not heard, even though I wanted to tell their story. I wanted to get get them involved. They wouldn't allow me to. And so even that was and I think sometimes and we will talk about this in a, in a minute. Sometimes I think the research methods that we we employ limits our reach. And the, the, contrast that with the uh, the contracted projects as a research projects as I'm, I'm calling them. Everything has been predefined. The professionals are taking centre stage, and I've had to argue against pre-identified young people being involved. And, and the reason why I say pre-identified young people, you know, I remember my days as a youth worker, you know, and a funder would come round. Who do we roll out the young people that we think are going to tell the story that we want the funders to hear? And so I think there's a the, the, there's an issue there as a researcher. Who do we trust, and how much uh, how much leeway do we have in shaping, you know, projects that we're doing for other people to ensure that we're not just re regurgitating the same old uh, uh, stories out there? And kind of, I've got this picture of this hall in there. For years, I, I ran this hall, and I ran it with this. Um, lady, she's a mother of a uh, mother of two children, and one of one of the, the children was, was an older lady, um, well, kind of 18, 19 year old girl, who ended up kind of doing lots of projects with me as well. Um, and I really wanted to get her voice. And now, you know, she was known on this in quite a loud mouth. She was known on the state for uh, for all kinds of things. But when you sat down and listened to her, she really kind of knew. Every, what was going on the on the estate and but she wouldn't do this interview with me she's like James I have nothing to say nothing to say at all and so one day we were cleaning this hall after uh, after a party and I said look you know I really want to hear from you I'm just look if I just put my phone here and I'm going to record our conversation I'm going to show you how much information you have to share and she was thought I was a bit mad but after an hour of cleaning up I just stopped the recording I said look that's all I wanted to hear from you. She said, but I tell you that all the time. And I say, I know. And that's why I needed to hear your voice in this research. Your voice needed to be heard. And I think sometimes we need a, a more flexible process of capturing uh, people's voices. And sometimes the location, the time, the data capture me methods are not really conducive to listening to the voices of those that, that really need to be heard you know my lots of my research nearly all of my research with with young people on this estate and and elsewhere in my in, in my projects they haven't been sit down let's talk interviews you know sometimes i've just said look can i grab 10 minutes with you now as we're walking to somewhere um you know is it all right to record it 
And I think we need to be far more flexible in how we look to try and capture young people's uh, stories. When you're doing ethnography, it's, it, it is a lot easier. There's lots of young people that didn't want to be interviewed uh, for me, and then something would happen on the estate, and I'd be walking through, and they'd say, James, stop. Watch this. Watch this so that you can write about it in your PhD. Typically, you know, it was when kind of the police had lined up a group of young people, um, you know, and, and handcuffed them to do kind of quite kind of in, in, in some respects, quite violent searches on, on, on those young people. So, James, please just stand and watch for us and then you can write about it. And so I think we need to be far more flexible when we're, when we're doing this, these types of research. And one, one lady I, was to, I, I spoke to on the phone the other day who wanted to be part of this, uh, one of the projects I'm doing for a local authority, and, but she, again, you know, didn't really know why she'd been, been asked to, to take part. She was very unsure about the interview, and I just said, look, I'll tell you what to do when you have a thought about about something to do with the topic that we're doing the research about just drop me a voice note on whatsapp and then i will compile all of those voice notes together and put them in a recording and send it to you and ask you is is this okay and i think that flexibility is some of the things that we need to to as researchers it, it doesn't always it might not fit the methodological processes that will enable it to be go through peer review but we need to I think we need to move away from that and think about actually how are we going to capture the voices in those that we want to, to hear from and I guess one of the my concerns like that Svetlana said at the very beginning actually am I exploiting my relationships with people you know, there could have been a very legitimate, the, the lady that I, I interviewed in the hall, there could be a very legitimate reason why she didn't want to voice her. But I used my friendship with her to get that interview. And now that might be a good thing. But also I've got to ask myself, is that fair? And that at which point do I just say enough is enough? No, I'm following up one of the this research now, and there's a, a young guy who... Um, you know, got he got excluded from school for carrying a knife and um, all kinds of things. Arrested for class A and class B. Um, he's now uh, in his final year at university to be uh, in law. And I was like, I really need. You know, I, I said to him, I really want your your story. Your story here. Um, you know, and I sat down with him for absolute ages talking about stuff. He want, it was I was in his flat because he wanted to, me to help him with a job application. And I said, look, I really want to capture this. Can we not just... And he kept saying, James, no, I'm not ready to tell people about it. I don't want people to know the good or the bad. I just want to be private. And how, at which point do I just say, you know what? that's okay i need to accept that some people aren't going to be on on this and how do i ensure that i do not exploit my closeness with respondents you know so many times i've just i've gone up to someone i said but come on it's me you know me and they're like oh yeah all right then okay i'll do it is that it, it, just because they trust me and they feel indebted to me for some reason maybe because of friendship should i exploit that And one of the other things that I wanted to kind of touch on before we, we, we finish is the, the, the knowledge that I'm creating with these young people or, or, or the, these residents. Am I allowing a holistic perspective? And I've got this, this picture of this, this guy here. This is um, one of the guys that I interviewed back in... I think 2013 and this is taken from a um, YouTube video I've kind of blurred it so you, you on purpose so you can't can't recognize it at the time when the, he was making these YouTube videos you know it was stereotypical of the what the likes you'll get in a 
uh, hear stories about in the press, you know, very violent, you know, every time he was about uh, getting the gun, shooting people, all of this stuff. Outside of these videos, when I talked to him, you know, his family is a very religious family. He was at great tension with his his family and his friends and what was going on. Now, most, a lot of gangs research and a lot of research around young people would take that snapshot and say, that's what's going on. That Look at that young person in that video. Look at, he, look at what he's doing. All of these things. I interviewed him again three weeks ago. He's an SEN teacher in, in, in a Peru. And outside of that, he's a youth worker for a church. If we take that snapshot, are we really giving a fair representation of the lives of especially young people who are going through that transitional period in their lives? And is it fair just to say, you know, I'm going to take the views of these young people in that period of time? And then, you know, two, three years later, have a PhD, you know, a year afterwards, maybe it'll get published, something will get published. And it could be people then can read that four or five years time about something that a uh, views of a young person or the, the experiences of a young person 10 years ago. And that's their, that representation of that person that we so desperately wanted to hear from. And what are we doing as researchers to follow up on that and to get a more balanced, a more holistic perspective of what those young people or other vulnerable people going through? Are we really addressing that imbalance or are we just simply uh, trying to get that snapshot for our, our publications? And so to, to finish my closing remarks are really, in my research, how am I using my position to take to shape the research? Am I try? Am I challenging these mainstream narratives? Am I, you know, in some cases, I've had to ask myself, am I, you know, bold enough in meetings to challenge these mainstream narratives when I might be just a hired researcher? Um, and how much of what we do is about collaboration as researchers? How am I allowing the, the respondents and the people around say, let's, sh James, this is how the research should be shaped. You know, thankfully in my kind of uh, doing my, my ethnography research, so many people kind of said, James, you need to include this and James, you need to, and still, you know, one of my challenges still today, people send me kind of messages about, did you see this was going on or, have you seen what someone has posted on such and such? This is this is so outrageous. You know, that side of those research that research is finished. So but they still are sending me things. So they still have something to tell. And maybe through collaboration I need to find another way to express that and, and also to tell it. And secondly is the flexibility of the research design. You know, the standard interviews, especially at the moment, via Teams, via Skype, it doesn't work for everyone. Focus groups don't work for everyone. What, what, how can we be flexible in the research, the data collection, to enable those that maybe have been marginalized, have been silenced, to get their voice ac across in a way that they feel comfortable getting across, not in a way that we feel suits our needs. And secondly, and lastly, sorry, the holistic approach to the respondent. How does their position change over time and how do I enable my research to reflect that change over time? And it's that dynamism of their life properly represented. And so obviously I've, I've, I've started saying there's had more questions and answers and I've ended up with kind of lots of questions rather than than any kind of conclusions but I, I go back to um, Svetlana now and it'd be good to see how other people might be able to answer those questions in the Q&A.
Okay. Okay, th thanks very much, James, for this uh, wonderful, profound and heartfelt concerns about uh, our research practice and also interesting ideas of what can be done to be more responsive to the needs of uh, people we work with and studies. Just uh, really grateful and uh, just shows how important it is to have these conversations which we actually have much uh, too rarely. Um, so th 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 thank you very, very much and we will uh, come back to questions and comments uh, at the end of our seminar. So, 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 so now I'm very pleased to introduce our third and final speakers this evening, uh, Dr. Tara Young from the University of Kent and Dr. Susie Holly from the University of Cambridge. I'm sure many of you uh, know Tara, who uh, used to work here at London. It's lovely to see her back uh, a bit briefly here. And uh, Tara's research interests include collective offending, uh, gangs, and gendered violence. And uh, her work argues against uh, prevailing uh, discourses um, identifying gangs as the key variable in increasing levels of serious violence. Tara is currently a co-investigator on a study looking at prison liver, social inclusion and resistance. Uh, her colleague, uh, Dr. Susie Halle, is a senior research associate at the Institute uh, of Criminology at the University of Cambridge, and she has worked on various projects, including an examination of staff and prisoner quality of life in private and public prisons. She has co-led and is currently following up on a major longitudinal study of the experiences of men and women serving long life sentences from a young age and also a groundbreaking study of practitioners and young people's conceptions of friendship and violence in the context of joint enterprise. Tara and Susie have recently completed a two-year ESRC-funded project examining conceptions of friendship, violence, and legal consciousness among young people engaged to serious uh, forms of uh, collective violence in which the law of complicity could apply. And their most recent publication is Silence, Joint Enterprise, and the Legal Trap, published this year. So today, Tara and Susie's talk is entitled Silencing of Young People and Epistemic Injustice in the Context of Joint Enterprise. So as I understand it, uh, uh, Tara, uh, Susie will be first here yeah, and Tara, Tara will continue the talk. So, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Svetlana, and thank you so much for inviting us to speak today. We're really pleased to hear uh, to be here. Thank you to Julius and James. It's really interesting to hear about your work um, and your thoughts on epistemic privilege. Lots and lots of food for thought. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, so yeah, today Tara and I are going to be drawing on a study of what is commonly referred to as joint enterprise to consider the ways that young people are silenced during investigations into group violence um, and how their experiential knowledge is muted in court cases in which music videos are used as evidence against them. So I'm going to outline the background of the study. Uh, the methods and briefly present our findings on the silencing that occurs during police investigations. And this is for two reasons. Firstly, to help us understand why the experiences and perspectives of young men and women drawn into the criminal justice net using joint enterprise are silenced um, from the outset. And secondly, to contextualise Tara's presentation. So specifically, Tara will use music videos to exemplify the way in which young people and um, young black and mixed race men in particular experience epistemic injustice in the context of such cases. 
So specifically, we argue that when drill and grime music videos are introduced into court in cases of serious multi-handed violence, we see young people's experiential knowledge being muted or smothered, while the testimonies of police are bestowed with um, credibility excess in the form of expert excess. So this means that police testimony uh, is likely to be believed because of their social status as authority figures. And this is despite research demonstrating that the police misrepresent and misunderstand the music genres that they are decoding for the court. So before I present our study, I just want to outline what we mean by joint enterprise. Um, lots of people might know what it means, but just to make sure we're all sort of on the same page. Um, it's actually more accurately now uh, termed complicity or secondary liability. And it's a really complex area of law. So I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail um, due to the time constraints. So if anybody has any specific questions um, later on, please do ask. So secondary liability enables more than one person to be convicted of a single offence. Um, in practice, this means, for example, if four men um, were in a pub and uh, one of them got into a fight, then someone uh, and one of them uh, killed the people, uh, killed a victim, then the three friends or secondary parties could also be convicted of murder too, if they were considered to have intended to encourage and assist the person who um, killed the victim. There was a law change in 2016, which amended the circumstances in which secondary parties could be considered culpable for the crime committed by the perpetrator. So before 2016, the three friends in our fright scenario could have been convicted if they only foresaw that the perpetrator might act as he did. Although this has now been abolished, foresight can still be used to infer that they intended to encourage or assist him. So what this means in reality is that the bar for culpability has been lifted, but only slightly, as our research suggests that there hasn't been a great deal of change um, in the way that the police and the CPS apply joint enterprise or secondary liability. And so to give you a little detail about the study, its aim was to explore joint enterprise and the way it was applied in cases of serious violence involving groups of young people. We were also interested in the way that it was understood by practitioners and by young people themselves. And because there's so little research in the area, we undertook a really broad study involving semi-structured interviews with people who fell into four different groups. So firstly, we interviewed 19 homicide and trident gang detectives in the Metropolitan Police Force in London. Um, and we also interviewed two civilian intelligence officers who had experience of analysing social media output. Secondly, we interviewed 22 defence and prosecution lawyers. So this included Treasury Council, uh, they're the lawyers who um, undertake prosecution for the state, uh, defence barristers and solicitors, and solicitors working for the Crown Prosecution Service. Our third group were prisoners. So we interviewed 36 men and women convicted of serious violence when they were aged 25 or younger, in which joint enterprise was relevant to their case. The men and women in our study had been convicted of murder, manslaughter or grievous bodily harm. Um, and our fourth group were young people in the community. Uh, we interviewed 57 uh, young uh, men and women, young boys and girls, um, who had a range of experiences of violence. Uh, we've got two papers that have been published to sort of that cover the range of these samples and two that are in process, um, progress at the moment. But it, for the purpose of this presentation today, we're focusing on the interviews with the police the lawyers and with prisoners. So as I said, I'm briefly going to talk about the way in which young people are silenced during police investigations for two reasons. Firstly, to help us understand why young people are silenced in this context. And secondly, in order to frame the findings that Tara will present. So specifically, I will explain that the majority of young suspects drawn into investigations uh, as secondary parties uh, that we interviewed remain silent in police interviews due to their fears um, about the legal risks of talking. However, their silence then kind of creates this space for the police and prosecution to develop a case narrative. And it's in this space that evidence such as music videos can be used to help the pros prosecution build a kind of plausible storyline about why the violence took place and why each of the people charged may be guilty of the substantive offence. So while a lot has been made about the wall of silence in literature, 
which roots lay people's refusal to engage with the police in kind of cultural issues. As I've said, it was the legal risks of talking that convinced young suspects drawn into investigations as, uh, into se serious group violence as secondary parties to remain silent. Although many were unaware of the law related to secondary liability when they were arrested, through their solicitors or through friends and family, they came to understand that they could be convicted of serious violent offence, such as murder, and face years or even decades in prison, despite having not committed the murder itself. So specifically their concerns about talking centred on being tripped up in police interviews. And as one person, uh, young person said, admitting to anything, even involvement, can end up you getting a murder conviction. So in this context, young people believe that the best strategy was to remain silent, often on the advice of their solicitors. So young people recognise their own vulnerabilities that emanated from their age, from their lack of experience and their ignorance of the, in regards to the law. And for young black men in particular, vulnerability was also rooted in the kind of multiple and accumulated negative interactions that they'd had with the police, often which began in childhood as well as their kind of acute awareness of the history of police mistreatment of their community and institutional racism. So in this context, they made racial appraisals about their vulnerability to being legally harmed and their limited ability to protect themselves. And against a backdrop of young people's ignorance and vulnerability, then their solicitors were considered to be what one person or young person uh, called basically God. So young people would follow their advice, which was almost always to remain silent. Although solicitors were obviously aware that the law meant that young people's silence could be inferred as guilt. Indeed, in police interviews, uh, police told us that by going no comment, young people increased the likelihood of being charged. As uh, detectives deduced, and one, this is a quote, if you haven't done anything, you're gonna say. So, however, this was based on officers' assessments of what constituted a kind of rational choice based on their normative male and white notions of rationality. So their assumptions ignored structural, racialized, gendered and prejudicial practices that mean that some young men and women were exposed to, which increased their risks of being convicted. And so young people's silence in investigations into serious violence involving others was driven by their fear of legal risks, which for young black men in particular was further embedded in their fear and distrust of the police. Young people were very aware that the police were in a much stronger position to frame the narrative of the incident due to their skills and expertise. And this is what kept them quiet. However, this is ironic and also deeply troubling for two reasons relevant to our talk today. So firstly, that it is young secondary party silence that contributes to them being charged with a serious violent offence. And secondly, that in the space created by their silence, a case narrative must be devised by the police and prosecution council to make sense of the violent incident for which they're being tried. And then so music videos offer the police one form of evidence upon which to build and support an existing case narrative and Tara is going to go on to describe this process and the kind of epistemic injustice that this contributes to. So I'm going to pass over to Tara, I hope. Yeah, you're there. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Thanks, Susie. OK, before I go on to outline the findings, I feel it necessary to draw attention to the epistemic injustice as conceptualised by Miranda Fricker in her article entitled Epistemic Injustice and a Role for Virtue in the Politics of Knowing, as this, I think, um, helps to theoretically frame our thinking about the conditions under which young people involved in serious violent crimes ex experience epistemic injustice. In her paper, Fricker illustrates how in dialogical interactions, a person or person speak and another person or person hears what is being said by the speaker and vice versa. In uh, the dialogical interaction, if it's equal, it's uh, symmetrical. According to Fricker, how we hear and understand what others say as truth is determined upon the knowledge a hearer holds about the speaker's general demeanour, their background and assumptions on whether the speaker is 
or will be telling the truth. The testimonial sensibilities or judgments the he hold about the speaker is also influenced by idealized notions of normative social truths. The context or testimonial encounters in which the speech is emitted and the relational power between the speaker and the hearer. So dialogical um, interactions are multi-layered processes and Fricker further notes in this article how cultural stereotypes inform human interactions and when these are unfairly applied by the hearer in testimonial exchanges the speaker's truth will be considered both epistemically and ethically defective. So in distorted exchanges the hearer's prejudice against the speaker's testimony is interpreted in negative or indeed positive ways by giving the testimony more or less credibility than it deserves. Features such as a strange accent, gender, race or position of power can distort testimonial exchanges with power being a particularly strong influencer within the dialogic exchange. Indeed, where there is an imbalance of power between the speaker and the hearer, let's say between a young person and a police officer or an adult or a or a child, the latter occupies a position wherein, as Fricker notes, it costs little to nothing to disbelieve the speaker. In one of the examples given by Fricker to demonstrate the prejudicial impact of power is the courtroom setting in To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. I won't go into the story here, but suffice to say that the testimony of the speaker, a black man called Tom Robinson, accused of raping a white woman, was undermined by stereotypical and racist views in the courtroom held against him, so much so that they blocked the jury and court's ability to hear any truth in Tom's statement. Thus, his testimony suffered from credibility deficit and was deemed epistemologically untrustworthy against the credibility excess of the testimony of white witnesses and victims, experts and the mainly white um, courtroom. The outcome? Well, the jury found him guilty of rape. The epistemic injustice racial prejudice and destruction of innocence that occurred in the courtroom in this fictional novel, uh, together with Fricker's concepts, testimonial sensibilities and credibility and excess, are useful for trying to understand the conditions under which testimonial exchanges between a powerful institution such as the criminal justice system and marginalised individuals, groups, suspects and defendants um, whose capacity, capacity as a knower and a speaker of truth is undermined or discredited. So, for the remainder of the time I have left, I will draw attention to the way in which music videos offer the police one form of evidence upon which to build or support existing case, narrative, and where epistemic injustice can arise. So, music lyrics, as they are played out in an oral form or video form, are an artistic form of speech to which the hearer listens. It's been noted by a number of critical scholars on the use of rap, grime and drill music in criminal investigations, namely Ilan uh, 2020, Fastis 2019 and Bakali 2019, that police forces and criminal justice practitioners looking to curb the rates of violence amongst young people erroneously interpret urban music created by disenfranchised black and minority ethnic people as a genre that glorifies, procures, precipitates and otherwise condemns, um, sorry, commends violent and criminal behaviour. Oftentimes, music lyrics are interpreted in court as rhymed confessions or authentic accounts of criminality, motivation and intention to engage in serious violence.
Where such material is admitted into court, it has potential via the prosecution's case to prove actus and mens rea, illustrate association between defendants and demonstrate evidence of bad character. Our findings reveal where, that where such material is admitted into evidence, it has the potential to be reframed as true facts by the prosecution and police experts. And as one uh, prosecution lawyer said to us, and this is a quote, I've incidences where people are singing particular songs. We've, um, we've happened to them. They've gone along to a song with lyrics that suggested that they wanted to stab people. And this was a quote by a prosecution lawyer. I can see somebody saying that they're struggling to hear. Um, is it because my, vo my volume is too low? Is that better? Is that better? Okay, I'm just going to continue on. <laughs> okay. Um, Tara, sorry. In just... this way, police officers... Yeah, the, the the something happened and the and the volume went down, and it's quite hard to hear. Is there nothing's unplugged or okay. anything? Is it? It just suddenly switched. So is it better now? No, it's the same. Is it better? No. Neva, can you help? No. Hi. Sorry. Um, I don't. It's really weird, isn't it? Because it just suddenly stopped. Um, everything is still plugged in, is it, Tara? Um, do you want to maybe try not using the microphone? The internet connection doesn't seem great now. Yeah, your internet. It might be an idea to turn your video off, Tara. I know it's not ideal, but it might help with your broadband connection. Thank you. Can you try speaking again, please, Tara? Cooper. that you <laughs> I can't tell now because your video is off what? Yeah, that's not me oh okay can you hear me Maybe now is that you Tara yes I can we can hear yeah. you that's better Sus can you hear me yeah this is good yeah okay all right sorry about that no problem. That's right, great. Gonna... We can hear you loud and clear okay, now. I'm... Right, I'm going to continue. Okay, so I got to the point where I was saying that um, uh, when uh, music videos are evident uh, presented in court, they're often misframed as true facts by the prosecution and police experts. So in this way, police officers and prosecutions overly credit what is being said in the music videos as absolute true and authentic rather than interpreting the, interpreting the lyrics and speech as a part of an artistic performance. Um, and that there was another quote by a prosecuting lawyer that illustrates this. Um, he says, there was one I did where the defendant was rapping about a shooting he did and it was great basically and we could show what shooting it was and he did do it and he'd been convicted of it so this isn't bullshit this is true when he says I'm going to kill this person by because of this and then it happens this isn't just kids showing off messing about it's real however research shows that urban music rap drill and grime 
draws on lyrical formulas, stock tropes, stock topics that are shared between performers and their audiences. In this context, amateur artists often imitate um, more um, uh, well-known artists and key elements of the codes of the street to demonstrate their own credibility within the genre and build a reputation of on road, um, not just on road, but in the attention economy um, that is drill, rap and, and grime um, that thrives on the notion of keeping it real. In the distorted exchange between the speaker and the hearer, the lyrics in the music video is given more credibility than it deserves, and the speaker's truth is considered as epistem epistem epistemically and ethically defective. It's arguable that this is especially the case in complex cases of multi-handed violent crime where it isn't always possible to detect who is the principal offender or where the case is constructed around a well-established gang narrative found in the music videos. According to Fricker, how we hear and understand what others say as truth is determined upon the knowledge a hearer holds about the speaker's general demeanour, background and assumptions on whether the speaker is or will tell the truth. The contrast between what is assumed by the demeanour of the young people in the music video, which may reflect stereotypes associated with the gang narrative and the assumptions that are made about uh, are made by the police as holders of this knowledge is stark. However, in court, the credibility bestowed on the testimony of the police is likely to be excessive compared to their actual knowledge. As research has shown, the inability of practitioners to determine the difference between artists, extras, and gang involved youth is in, il, illustrated by their dysfunctional expertise when attempting to decode the slang, the hand movements um, and the visual representation of young people in music videos and in the lyrics themselves. In our study, police and prosecution lawyers admitted that they struggled with the terminology used in rap music um, videos in lyrics. One of the intelligence officers responsible for sifting through online content for the Met Police explained, it's a challenge for us, the MPS, as an organisation to understand what the different terms mean and all that sort of thing. It's difficult for us. So practitioners also raised concern about how well jury members were able to recognise the construction of an online persona of a rapper and their offline behaviour, particularly in music videos, where context is important in shaping an individual's appearance and comportment. Such worries are valid given the issue of confirmation bias in juries. That is where the jury members seek out evidence that supports the idea of gang membership or dangerousness which can sway them in pre prejudicial ways and influence the outcome, i.e. discredit the defence testimony in favour of the prosecution's truth, inverted commas, as experts. As in Harper Lee's courtroom, the credibility of the defence position is undermined by the pathologisation of rap, grime and drill music and the stereotypical racial and criminalising views held about black and brown young men who make the type of music that trans translates well into evidence. If we accept that epistemic just injustice happens when the wrong degree of credibility is attributed to what the speaker has said because of some form of prejudice on the part of the hearer, then this is epistemic injustice. 
what we did find was that in some cases judges recognize that people's online persona may not reflect their real world behavior and that online identities can be performative and in keeping with pace legislation refused the admittance of prejudicial evidence that had no probative value to the case in other words some judges critically exercised testimonial sensibility and engaged in the reflexive critical openness required to recognize the prejudicial distortion, distortions in certain cases, thus giving due weight to the voices of young people. However, we, don't, we do not yet know how consistent this approach is across the system. Ultimately, our research and other work in this area raises concerns about potential epistemic injustice that emerges from the credibility excess bestowed on the police who are presented as experts in the field in which the, they have limited knowledge and expertise. There is a great deal of research on the production of grime and drill music and much of it directly disputes many of the claims that the police and the prosecution's lawyers make about what involvement in such music evidences. It is important that the police are educated about what young people's involvement in the production of music really means and that in the absence of this happening the Defence Council introduce experts in grime and drill music to counter such prejudicial claims. Without this we fear that epistemic injustice will continue, particularly in the context of young people's silence. One of the questions that was asked earlier was how we can avoid exploiting, um, by James, uh, exploiting the people who speak to us and privilege their knowledge. I take my position from the late Roger Matthews and from Realist Criminology that expresses a commitment to taking crime and victimization seriously and making our work policy relevant. Otherwise, as researchers, we run the very real risk of abusing our position of power. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thanks a lot uh, uh, for, the, for this uh, thorough series for, for the for this fascinating but frankly quite mind-boggling uh, exposition of epistemic injustice and some things you know I, I really like I think other people didn't even think were possible to use music as evidence against people so it's like you know if you're weak and vulnerable you know you, you just can't win if you are silenced you you know this is taken against you you know what you, you your creativity is taken against you so it's it's really re really terrible but um i think uh, um, you, you know this this uh, ma makes the whole subject of epistemic injustice even more important for for us as researchers uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time, but uh, uh, I suggest that um, without any panel discussion, we just move to to questions and answers. And there were there were quite a few questions uh, which I will try to summarize briefly. So, so Julius, uh, people wondered about your sample, uh, how how you got it and uh, uh, also how, how you made the teenagers uh, sh share experiences with you uh, and also there was a question about whether you got any alternative explanations to the causes of the riots uh, as, as uh, opposed to the kind of media and expert explanations so here there yeah thanks mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thank you for those questions and some of them were quite critical, which I appreciate. Uh, I also realised I wasn't very self-reflexive during my talk, so I didn't really speak about my positionality with respect to the research participants. So uh, you said, uh, yeah, the sample, yeah, so the sample more or less reflected um, 
the the demographic of uh, young people in Tottenham. Uh, I think that there were. I mean, let me firstly say that I kind of used an interpretative phenomenological analysis approach to interviewing the young people. And uh, as you may know, with phenomenological studies, we're not really after a, a big sample. So it was a relatively small sample and the focus was more on in-depth interviews. And uh, it was a very varied sample, but uh, I think I had one uh, young person who was uh, perhaps would identify himself as a white other. He had a Turkish uh, Turkish heritage, except for that uh, the mo most of the research participants had either a West African heritage or Caribbean heritage. There were also one from a Somali her heritage and uh, uh, one young woman born in Kenya and one from Eritrea. Uh, so uh, it's very hard to, to, to state whether I privileged some epistemic uh, viewpoints than others. I think that uh, it's inevitable that um, uh, elements of bias were sneaking in into these um, interviews. And uh, I think I also have to stress that my research was firstly not about the riots, nor was it initially about prejudice or, or different forms of discrimination. So I was actually interested in um, understanding um, young people's reflexive capacity. So I was interested in the notion of reflexivity and how young people think about themselves in relation to their social environment. But of course, in those interviews, the young people started speaking about the riots and it's had an immense effect on them and how they're being perceived. So it was kind of inevitable that when we speak about youth identities that uh, the riots came up. So quite a varied sample, uh, but of course, when you carry out phenomenological research, it's impossible to capture quantity. And um, that of course means that uh, there are huge limitations to my study. Uh, I also mentioned that I have the experience of working in the area of Tottenham and living in the area of Tottenham, where I'm actually at right now. So I drew upon those experiences as well. And, and to be honest with you, sometimes when you work with young people, you can gain more, especially as a youth worker or youth outreach manager, you can draw more interesting information from the young people than when you are presenting yourself as a researcher. And I suppose that is also responding to the other question. I, I don't know, was it Laila perhaps? Laila Charlesworth asking about, um, uh, about that. So I didn't, I think she asked about, uh, well, I can't actually remember now. I perhaps you should find these questions and have them in front of me. So I think uh, Laila here says, uh, um, I'd love to know how you overcame the idea of other, getting the teenagers to share their experiences. So, uh, well, I, I suppose there were, again, huge limitations. Uh, so, of course, uh, the first impression of me, perhaps maybe as a white man. And uh, secondly, I'm being introduced as a researcher, which doesn't help. So it can be quite a bad starting point uh, in, in terms of carrying out the, the research. But uh, I think a number of steps were taken in order to facilitate an, an environment where the research participants could remain relatively authentic. So of course it's advantageous to have worked and lived in Tottenham, and I knew all the gatekeepers in advance. And that allowed me to attend uh, sessions with the young people before the interviews started. So I attended um, uh, a football session. I attended a project that took place at um, 
an enterprise center on Tottenham High Road. So I got to kind of know them slowly before I started the interview. So that was kind of my approach, build a bit of rapport before I started the interviews. And then I allowed the, in, the interviewees to choose where the interviews took place, provided it was a safe space. So the interviews took place in a very familiar setting to them. And um, so I think all of that together allowed them to speak relatively freely. However, I'm pretty sure that, for example, with some of them, there was a bit of a gender bias among the sample as well. There were a lot more young women who came forward to, to be interviewed than young men. And uh, I suppose if, if, a young, if, a, if a black woman carried out the interviews, she would perhaps be able to draw more information and perhaps allow the, uh, the, the young women to open up uh, further. So there were some limitations, but I tried to facilitate an environment for them that, that were relatively, that they considered safe. Uh, I also carried out some interviews with two or three young people at the same time, which allowed them to perhaps, again, maybe be in an environment where they were dom the dominant group as opposed to uh, me and the single interviewee. So I suppose I'll address two questions. Uh, there were another one about, um, yeah, about truth, wasn't it? Um, yeah, so Amanda, Dr. Amanda Holland, psychology. I assume your last name is not psychology. So you asked about the uh, truth coming from uh, the young people as opposed to the experts. So. Uh, I think the idea of internal perspective for me is that you can allow for heterogeneity. The internal perspective doesn't say anything about uh, the sample being homogeneous. So there were many sometimes contradictory statements from, from the young people as well. I think when it came to talking about the media, they were quite unanimous in their critique. but. Um, Yes, for example, uh, they spoke about gang culture on a regular basis, and the vast majority of them said that, uh, you know, they don't know anybody who are in a gang. Uh, you know, they, they hear sometimes young people speaking about Tottenham Mandem and Wood Green gang, but they don't know anybody who are members of it. So they felt that it's been vastly exaggerated in the media, this kind of gang culture. But there were a couple of people who said that they knew uh, gang members, and it's quite prevalent. But they also stated that most of the young people are pretending to have connections, while, it, as a matter of fact, uh, they, they are quite distanced from these gangs. So there were quite a lot of contradictory statements. And um, I also attended a viewing of a film uh, about the Tottenham riots in Birmingham, actually. There were some young people there who had been involved. And there were contradictory statements from the young people there as well. And one interesting thing that I noticed was that the um, sociologist who attended that viewing, they spoke about um, the riots were mainly due to inequality and structural socioeconomic factors. While the young people seem to have a bit more of a... Um, agentic view on it, more individu individualist view, where they spoke about um, some of the young people being involved apparently uh, had um, more self-interested, agentic um, motivations. So uh, I think I have answered the questions more or less, probably, probably not the best answers you've ever had. No, in the that was great. Uh, thank you very much, Julius. I think you, you answered quite comprehensively. Uh, th thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, we'll now need to move quickly uh, to some questions that people asked of James. So, so uh, to summarize them, Leila asked, I think, an important question of how the requirement of having a lengthy uh, paperwork, a participant uh, 
in the information forms, consent forms, you know, um, can really inhibit this kind of flexible uh, fieldwork that you are recommended. What do, uh, recommending? What do you think? Yeah, I, I um, probably out of twenty two interviews with young people uh, that I've done for the PhD research, probably one person signed a consent form. Um, I, I I put in my ethics form that I wasn't going to get them to sign it, um, and I, I I just think we shouldn't request people sign paperwork. Um, you can do you can do it other ways. I've I've done it through text message. Are you okay for the to do the interview? Uh, you know, in in a, in an hour's time. To, yes, you know, and that's that's my 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 kind of consent. Um, and then you talk through at the start of the interview. You talk through um, what it's about, and you ask them to do, do you understand? And that's it. That I will, you know, I I think the days of paper forms and paper kind of explanations. I, yeah, I, I I I I think soon. I think well, initially working with young people, we might need to to get rid of them anyway. There's a lot a lot of other ways that we can do it in and do it in a way that. Actually, young people, we know then young people have understood it. If we give a young person a bit of paper or anyone a, a, a bit of paper, how do we know we've, they've read it? Um, no, excellent. I, I, uh, to be honest, I agree with you. And, and in fact, it's possible to, to, to get research ethics committee's approval for oral consent. This, this, is all, all, this also can be done. Uh, so, so we shouldn't feel shackled by by, by these forms. Uh, there was also a question from Amanda uh, about the agenda. You think that practitioners, particularly uh, people in youth clubs, use when they put forward the samples for you as the researcher, the samples of, of, of research participants? Yeah, I, I, I mean, and I've been on this side of it as well um, and I think you often there's lots of pressure to show that you're doing a good job as a as a professional um, and so you want people to uh, you want to put people forward that are that will tell that story um, and so maybe you'll get some uh, that won't but the majority will tell you tell you a good story I think the other Maybe one of the other issues with kind of relying on youth clubs and, and things like that. A particular type of person goes to a youth club. Um, you know, you and though that youth club will have a particular characteristic of a young person. Um, you know, there might be some differences, but that young person will feel comfortable in that youth club. What about the those that don't? don't feel comfortable what about those that don't go to youth clubs so I think using professionals as, as gatekeepers in general it it's okay but it is still problematic because you're one you're getting those that are cherry picked to potentially to tell, to tell the story that the, that the professional wants you to hear um, but also you're, you're getting a, a sample that isn't representative of everyone um, and so I think that there are there's I think there are concerns that way. It is difficult, um, you know, to do to do it other ways other than actually just you know knowing some young people and, and kind of a more of a snowball uh, sample. Again, that has its its challenges. What I've done recently with one local authority, um, I it took a lot of uh, persuading, but again, they were saying, well. We'll get you the list of young people that you can interview and I said no what I want is the list of young people that you work with and I will tell you who I'm going to interview um, and you know that took some negotiation but I said otherwise I can't this can't be robust um, and so there you as a research we need to make sure that we are um, we have more say in what what other organisations are data they're giving us, um, but again, it's again, it's not that that's not going to be the perfect situation. Um, there are going to be flaws in that as well. 
Great, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, there is one other question which uh, you know I'm not sure we have time to, to answer really about the researchers' influence on what uh, the participants would tell them. If you can, can maybe <laughs> say in one sentence. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, yeah, that's that's massive, um, and I think the only way that you can really overcome that is. Um, one by having a good relationship with with them so they can be open and honest or trying to capture them in their real life kind of uh, situation so lots of young people that i've interviewed you know i'd be out about watching them observing them through kind of various reasons um and then i would ask them in the interview can you tell me about this um you know and it's a look i know you know i i, I saw it i know what what happened I'm not judging you about it. Just explain it to me. And if they'd wanted to, that's great. If they didn't, then we can't talk about it. Um, but there are, you know, it is very. Uh, we've got to understand that that we have a massive part. Uh, our our, our um, presence changes everything, and we can't get away from that. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, James, and. Uh, 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 I've noticed that we don't have uh, questions, only only comments about Taras and, uh, and, uh, and Susie's uh, paper. I think we all stand <laughs> both by, by the quality of this paper, which was excellent, but also by, by, by what we've learned uh, from it about uh, this real uh, epistemic injustice that they've uncovered. So, uh, is there anybody in in the audience who would like to, to use this brief time we've got left to, to ask Tara and Susie any questions? Uh, can I just ask them? Uh, is 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 there uh, some kind of um, attempt? from the legal community to, to, to find this use of music, uh, music videos as evidence. Is there what, sorry Svetlana, I missed the start yeah, of that question. Yeah. By, by the legal community to find this practice and also James has a, has a question. Yeah, if you want to take that or? I'm sorry, I, I yes. missed the start of the question, so sorry. So, um, Svetlana was saying, is there any um, a strategy from the legal to community to sort of counteract um, the um, presentation of music videos as evidence? Is that right, Svetlana? Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, there, there, there are um, some uh, practitioners um, that are... Um, beginning to speak out about the use of um, music videos um, as evidence in court. Um, indeed, within our sample, we had um, a number of defence and prosecution lawyers that would, were speaking to the um, lack of probative value for some um, of the music videos and as we saw as you saw in the talk um, there were some judges that were becoming live to judicial impact of, of this material as presented in, in court there's also some American uh, um, scholars legal scholars that are um, working to uh, counteract the evidence so there's a big call towards ensuring that there is expertise for the defense um, that can counteract the prosecution's case. So, so there is a movement. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Tara. And I think James also had the last question. Yeah, thanks. I, I, my, it looks like my connection is dodgy, so uh, apologies you, if it's not coming through uh, very well. Um, Uh, sorry, my, 
I can hear. I can hear you, James. Do you want to try? Okay. So yeah, my my connection is playing up a bit. Um, I just, uh, Tara, you mentioned about kind of experts to to counter, um, sort of the police's interpretation of these videos. I'm doing a little bit of kind of research on kind of draw at the moment as well. I I have to say I'm not very convinced by even the academics and their kind of understanding of it. Um, who do you think could be those those experts um, and how do we ensure that they are listened to in court? James, so, I'm in Sorry. No, go, Susie, first. I was just going to say, James, I'm interested in um, why you're not convinced by the academic view. Uh, partly because I, it's almost like I'm, uh, when I'm looking at them, they what even one said, you know, I watched hundreds of YouTube videos. Okay, that for me, that's not how do you how do you gain not uh, like the yeah. knowledge from from that? And so that's what they're, they're even they're still removed from those young people. Yeah, um, I think we've um, we've been on a few seminars now about kind of drill and grind music, and I, I don't think there are many kind of experts that are known in the system if you know what I mean like so I don't think defense lawyers know who to go to to be honest I think there's one or two kind of key academics who might be considered experts in the field but having been on seminars with people who are making and producing music videos with young people or just making and producing music um, it seems to me to be those people and actually it reminded me of something I think Julius talked about yeah about the kind of epistemic privilege of people who are you know who have that knowledge because that is their sort of embodied experience of they are in that world um i suppose it's quite difficult because um and this is kind of the conversation that you were having with yourself i think earlier about what makes researchers the experts um and why would one researcher who has uh, done some work in this in an area be more expert than individuals who are living in in that world and I think that is a you know there's there's arguments on both sides of that debate about who is more expert or, or where expertise kind of or knowledge generates from uh I don't think I answered your question sorry no no I think that's good I think I, I, I yeah I would kind of more like what you said actually get the get some of the producers in um, they will have far more of an understanding than anyone else, I think. So I think, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Uh, but I guess, yeah. I guess the problem in a sort of court is then about their own credibility and how we make sure that their credibility is recognised and um, things like that. Can can I make Tara? Did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I I'd like to say that there are also um, academic lawyers, practicing lawyers, who also have tried many 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 cases where music videos have been used as evidence and so they've built up um, a knowledge not only um, of the uh, lack of probative value of music videos but also of how um, how trial cases progress um, when music videos and other mediums um, are, are produced as evidence or allowed into evidence actually um, but I agree with you I think that um, as academics we have uh, our expertise in many ways is to, is to draw on our own research but also the um, uh, research um, and scholarship within our field and the position of expertise should be um, extended to people who listen to drill grime and rap people who produce drill grime and rap um, as as they are um, clearly um, experts in in their field but as Susie said um, it's ensuring that their expertise is, is recognized as credible and, and valued um, within a criminal justice setting where um, where the um, prosecution are putting their case yeah get to put their case um, in front of a jury I hope that makes sense yeah, I, it's brilliant. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thanks a lot, Tara. Well, uh, I thank you so much, uh, Tara and uh, Susie, for explaining these things to us and for your wonderful 
presentation. Now I'm afraid uh, we need to, to finish now. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure we could have spent uh, an hour more talking about all these issues. Uh, but but we've run out of time. So uh, thank you very much for attending and participating in this event, which I hope you will agree has been intriguing and thought-provoking. And I hope that conversations and collaborations will continue and uh, we will be conducting this kind of research across disciplines. Uh, so please join me in thanking uh, uh, Tara, Susie, James, and Julius, uh, and of course many thanks um, to the research office and especially to Maiva for supporting us today. So please, uh, uh, pl please check our next event and uh, um, many thanks. And wherever you are, stay well, uh, stay safe, and stay connected. Thank you.